right, folks, we're at 3.30, um, so we'll get started uh, with this week's uh, Geospatial Forum. Um, I'm Aaron Hip. For those of you who do not know me, I'm a faculty fellow and, and have an office up here on the fifth floor. My home department is Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management. Um, a lot of my students, faculty, and post or postdoc and project managers are, are often sitting back, back left, so if there's shenanigans back there, um, blame them, not me. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to have Katie Holiday today uh, to be our guest. Um, Katie and I have a, a similar background. Katie has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Ecology, and then she moved from Ecology into Health. Uh, her BS is from Purdue. Uh, and then she came down from Indiana to Chapel Hill to get a PhD in um, Cardiovascular Disease Epidemiology in the Department of Epi at the Gilling School of Public Health. Uh, she transitioned from her PhD studies there to a postdoc, uh, staying in the realm of epidemiology but looking more at environmental epidemiology. Um, she's used a lot of GPS and accelerometry in trying to understand where people are, when they're active, and when they're sedentary, and that's going to be the basis of a lot of her talk today. Um, so thanks for, for coming today to hear Katie speak. Thanks, Katie. Thank you very much. Um, so, as Aaron said, um, I'm going to be talking today about um, built environment and how we assess it in health studies. And um, I think kind of one of the ideas behind this is to show um, where the public health field is in terms of thinking about exposure assessment, and then in turn how you all might be able to use your skills to help us um, better uh, measure the environments where people are active. Um, so I'll go over a brief outline. First, um, I'll talk about the public health significance of this. Uh, when we have an epidemiology talk, we always have to talk about um, public health significance. And then um, I'm going to describe three different exposure assessment issues uh, that I've seen in the literature. And then um, I'll go through some projects where I looked at these different issues. Um, first, I'm going to describe the overarching study population that I used and then um, talk about uh, the analyses for these issues, which center around the locational context of physical activity how we assess built environments, and then how long we should monitor um, individuals with a GPS in studies of physical activity. So I've been focused on physical activity because it's very important for prevention of a lot of chronic diseases and especially cardiovascular disease. It's associated with um, compression and morbidity, improved quality of life, and reduced health care costs. And there's a lot of health organizations that recommend that adults engage in at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic physical activity each week. And these recommendations tend to suggest that that activity occur in bouts of 10 or more minutes. Um, currently, there are studies underway to kind of examine the um, scientific merit because currently that 10-minute bout has just been a made-up number. It's, it's not based on anything. Um, so we're trying to develop um, better uh, recommendations. So if we think about that 150-minute um, recommendation, we see that across the U.S., um, nearly 50% of people don't meet that recommendation, and there are disparities in, in different groups, as we can see here for race, ethnicity in North Carolina. So given these numerous benefits of physical activity, as well as its low prevalence, it's important for us to think how we can motivate physical activity. Social ecological frameworks um, suggest that a variety of factors influence health behaviors, um, not just individual levels, but also um, larger picture community level factors like parks and recreation and neighborhoods. So this um, led me to want to study how the built environment may in influence uh, cardiovascular disease through physical activity. So the topic uh, of, of my talk suggests that exposure assessment is very important um, in studies of physical activity. And I'm going to talk through three different ways in which I see problems in the current literature um, and what I've done to try to improve this. So first, we have limited knowledge about how various locations contribute to adult physical activity. Um, a lot of the studies have used exposure assessment methods that don't really allow us to actu actually capture what we want to know. Um, so for example, um, the American Time Use Study uh, was used in 2008, um, which is normally a really good population to use because it's nationally representative. 
Um, but they had individual self-report locations of physical activity, and they reported nearly 40% of it is unclassified. So that's really leaving us with a lot of questions about where the rest of that activity is occurring. A lot of studies on this topic simply ask participants if they use a location, yes or no. Um, so this really is lacking in terms of quantification of how much time are they spending in a particular location, how does, how does that location um, contribute to their total physical activity. And so I think these kinds of issues illustrate that when we're doing data collection, we really need to be using methods that will allow us to um, gather specific data that will be useful. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so we want to make sure that we're collecting data um, that can actually help us answer the questions that we have. So the second um, topic area that we'll think about is um, how built environment exposure assessment methods um, are used in the field and, and how they need improvement. So I'm sure most of you are all familiar with what the built environment is, but in general we think about it as kind of the places in which people um, conduct their daily lives, the, the places that they go to live and work and recreate. And so we think about um, buildings and transportation systems, parks, all of those kinds of things. And the pattern in um, the built environment research has been to focus on these um, environments near participant homes. Um, so they might um, create a buffer around the participant's home and look at characteristics and then try to equate that with their physical activity levels. And um, as an example of this, in 2011, there was a um, systematic review of studies that looked at contextual environmental factors and their influences on cardiometabolic health. And 90% um, of those studies focused solely on the residential environment. Now things have started to get better um, recently, but in general we've been left with this very large body of literature that reports a lot of weak effects and inconsistent results, and it's really hard to translate this body of literature into uh, meaningful health interventions. So um, as just an example, um, this study uh, was uh, a very small study looking at regular trail users in um, Boston. And they had participants wear an accelerometer and a GPS at the same time. And they found that 10% uh, of their physical activity, their moderate physical activity, occurred in a home buffer and only 1% of their vigorous activity. And all the rest was occurring somewhere else out there in the world. Then they tried to look at some built environment characteristics in a one kilometer home buffer. And when they associated that with participants' total physical activity, they didn't see any um, significant associations. But when they limited it to physical activity that actually occurred within that home buffer, then they did see associations. So this kind of shows you um, kind of the masking of effects that we might see in this literature because of the misalignment of their exposures and their outcomes. And finally, um, we are starting to use GPS in a lot of studies of physical activity, but we don't have a good set of recommendations for using those monitors. Um, we have a lot of recommendations for accelerometers that measure the actual physical activity, but in terms of thinking about the geographic locations, um, there's just not literature out there yet. Um, so part of my work is going to uh, look at um, trying to figure out how long we should have participants wear these monitors. Um, oh, so, so this is just an example of um, there are a lot of studies like these that um, create these monitoring recommendations for accelerometers, um, but the, and, and this has resulted in this kind of seminal um, paper in the field that combines all of these recommendations and suggests that this is the value that we should be using. We should be monitoring adults for, um, and it's usually four or seven days of, res of um, monitoring for accelerometers. Um, but again, we don't have this for GPS units. So this has resulted in a lot of studies just using the accelerometer recommendation for their GPS when they design their study. Um, they'll say, we know we need to wear the accelerometer for four days, so we're going to have them wear the GPS for four days. But a lot of the thought in the field is that this isn't going to be long enough um, because we're looking at a variety of locations. So um, the 
papers that I'm going to talk about today um, tried to address these three different topics. Um, so the first goal was to develop and implement a protocol for identifying locations where adults engage in physical activity. And this was, again, to try to be able to quantify the amount of time that they're spending in these various locations. Uh, the second was to compare these traditional residential-based built environment exposure areas with the true locations of physical activity as measured by a GPS. And finally, to determine the minimum required GPS time um, for uh, studies of physical activity. So the study population that we used uh, was collected as part of um, the System for Observing Play and Recreation in Communities, or SOPARC, GPS sub-study. Um, so this was a larger study that was looking at how we sample um, physical activity in parks. And they recruited these individuals and then never really used the data um, from their GPS uh, for uh, publications. Um, so I was working with this data, um, but it was collected in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, from 2009 to 2011, and it was in um, each of the cities displayed on the map. So we had Los Angeles, California, um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Chapel Hill, Durham, North Carolina. And they recruited their participants from within these um, various parks that they were assessing, but also from homes uh, that were within one mile of those parks. So the participants wore an actigraph accelerometer, which um, allows us to measure physical activity. And that's done um, by measuring uh, activity at various thresholds. And for our study, we're considering um, a kind of moderate intensity activity uh, that might include things like light housework. Um, we also did some sensitivity analyses for higher intensity thresholds, but today I'm mostly just going to focus on the lower threshold. Um, and then we used a GPS unit um, that they wore concurrently for three weeks. And this unit recorded GPS points in one minute epochs. And it was um, using ground truthing to kind of improve its accuracy. So very briefly, um, I'm going to tell you about how we cleaned the physical activity data. Um, the main important thing is that we tried to identify bouts of physical activity that were at least 10 minutes long. And this was in part to go with that, um, the guidelines, but also since we know that those guidelines aren't necessarily um, a, a specific mark that we should be looking at, um, I did still want to use it uh, because I wanted to think about physical activity that was kind of occurring together, um, not just a minute here or there where someone was a little bit more active. I wanted kind of concentrated physical activity. Um, we also had uh, methods in place to identify times where participants didn't wear their accelerometer that we then used to remove those points. And we also required that um, the participants um, comply with those recommendations of wearing the accelerometer. So they had to wear it for at least four 10-hour days. Um, just some a bit more information about the GPS unit that we were using. Um, at the time, at least, it was um, a very good unit. Um, there were some tests of static and dynamic validity, validity that were done um, for static that uh, had a mean distance of 2.1 meters. And then for dynamic validity, they looked in a variety of different scenarios. So first, they looked at open space, and then um, kind of a moderate density, and then a high density urban area. Um, and it ranged from 5.2 meters in the um, open space to 20 meters in the um, high density area. So, unfortunately, while it's nice to have the, this data from across these five different sites, that also makes it very difficult to kind of um, incorporate GIS data that's across all of these locations. And because it was really important for us to identify um, very specific location types for our GPS monitoring aim, um, I ended up developing a um, visual coding protocol using Google Maps. Um, and today we're just going to focus on these main location codes, although, as you can see, we collected a variety of other information about our GPS points. So for the location coding, uh, we first removed points that were greater than 35 miles from home because we wanted kind of habitual, regular locations of activity. 
And then we used Google Fusion Tables, which is kind of a beta app that allows you to map multiple physical activity points at once, or GPS points at once. Um, and in doing this, we considered the overall pattern of the points, um, but we did assign each point an individual code. And we used tools like um, the satellite and historical street view option to um, make this temporally relevant to when the data was collected. So I'm going to give you a few examples of what these bouts look like so you have an idea of the accuracy of the GPS and, and what coding decisions we were made. Um, so in this case, this would have been coded as um, a bout along a road and then um, with some ending points in a school. Uh, for the next two images, we have bouts at parks here on a basketball court and here on a tennis court. This would have been points at either a participant's home or another residential location. Uh, we had bouts that occurred at, um, this is a Lowe's store, so these kind of big box stores that requires a lot of walking. And then a final example is along a um, trail in a park. In this last image, if we look at it um, in a larger picture, we see that you can kind of see the accuracy of the GPS and how uh, the GPS track matches with the um, park map of the trail. Um, so as you could probably expect, we did have some missing data that we had to deal with. Um, we decided that we would impute these locations in some cases using points nearby in time. Um, and so that happened for 34% of our missing data, which was 6% of the total data. Um, however, you know, most of that uh, information didn't get imputed because it was part of a long period of missing data where we couldn't really look at points before or after and comfortably identify the location. Um, and in many cases, this was because a participant was missing an entire day of their GPS monitoring. And we assume that one of the things could be that um, participants had to recharge the GPS every night. And so if they forgot to do that, the accelerometer would work, but the GPS wouldn't. So now I'll um, describe a little bit about the sociodemographic characteristics of our participants. Um, so they ranged in age from 18 to 85 and 44% were male. We had several different racial ethnic minority groups represented, as well as those from varied educational backgrounds. Um, the participants were distributed evenly be between categories of healthy weight, overweight, and obese, and they were recruited evenly from across the five um, study sites, with most of them recruited from the parks that they were working on, but a small, and a smaller number from nearby homes. So after all of our exclusions, we were left with a final sample of 223 individuals that wore their accelerometer and GPS for three weeks. And um, this, the sociodemographics of this group didn't differ significantly from the people that we originally enrolled. So first, um, we're going to move into thinking about the locational context of physical activity for these participants. Um, so I'm not going to go super into detail on um, this aim, because I think the, the later aims will be more interesting to you all. Um, but briefly, uh, as a reminder, we wanted to quantify the amount of physical activity time that was occurring in locations. And we did this by um, assuming that the GPS point represented one minute. And then because we have this kind of wide range of people in the study, we have 18-year-olds, we have 85-year-olds, um, we didn't want to compare the actual minutes of physical activity since that would differ so much between people. Um, so we were looking at the proportion of an individual's person's um, activity that occurred in each location. So for this um, lower moderate activity that we talked about, um, most of the activity did occur at home or on roads, um, but a substantial uh, proportion still occurred within parks. And then this is um, a little peek at something that I'm currently working on, um, but this would be taking that park data and looking at the actual park facilities that were being used. And for these um, adults, uh, over 80% of their physical activity occurred in just four different locations, and that was tennis courts, footpaths, open space, and basketball courts. Um, now, it is important to remember that these were individuals sampled from parks, so um, I wouldn't generalize this to the um, general population. You know, tennis court is a stationary activity, so if you're trying to find participants, you're more likely to find a participant playing tennis than you are someone who's running on a trail. Um, so just keep that in mind. These were adults, right? Yes. Yeah, 18 to 85. 
So the main reason I showed you that is because when we get to the GPS monitoring length aim, um, that is by location type. So I wanted you to see how we got those location types and, and kind of what it looked like. So um, the first major methodologic issue that I wanted to talk about is um, how built environments are measured in um, physical activity studies uh, that are conducted from a health perspective. So I know that many of you may be familiar with the idea of activity space, but for those that aren't, um, activity space can be thought of as just the overall space that a person spends their day-to-day -day life in. This is actually not for a person, this is for a wolf um, that wore a UPS tracker. But um, this blue line is the minimum convex polygon that is this wolf's activity space. So the same concept applies for people. Um, and I wanted to use this concept, but uh, I wanted to apply it specifically to physical activity bouts. So in general, activity space means anywhere. It's places they go to eat, to the library, to work. Um, and I just wanted to, to uh, minimize that to physical activity locations. So the two different areas that we're going to be comparing are first, these kind of traditional residential buffers. So in this image, um, the star is my home, and we have the circular residential buffers in yellow and the road network ones in green. And then we see my bouts of physical activity that I've shown. So this is me running around my home neighborhood, and then this is me at a nearby friend's house uh, where I run sometimes. So we see that only one of my bouts of activity is in this buffer, and another one is completely outside of them. So we're going to be comparing that with um, what I've called physical activity space. And in this case, it's taking that same overarching concept concept of activity space and applying it to just a single bout of physical activity. So for my two bouts of activity that we see on the left image, these are the corresponding physical activity spaces. And those are just two minimum convex polygons for each of the bouts. So this allowed me both to consider the total percent of physical activity time that's occurring in buffers, which is what we saw that Boston study do, but it also allowed me to look at the land area um, overlap. So I was able to see what percent of land area in a residential buffer was actually used for physical activity, and also the percent of land area in physical activity spaces that was overlapped by residential buffers. So for the first question, um, I looked at kind of standard half and one mile circular network buffers. And I saw that 39 to 48% of physical activity time was occurring in residential buffers. Um, so we are missing a lot of time um, if we think about um, just using residential buffers. And I'll say that the majority of that time is spent in the home, not out in the neighborhood. If you limit this to just um, uh, in neighborhood but not inside the home uh, physical activity, then the, the numbers are very small. And so I also looked at these by um, various sociodemographic characteristics, and I saw that um, age and the state of recruitment were associated with um, the time spent in buffers. And this proportion increased with age, so the oldest adults were using or having most of their more of their physical activity in buffers than the younger adults. And it was highest for participants in New Mexico and lowest for those in North Carolina, which, um, you know, for those of you around here, that might make sense. There's not a lot of places to visit in our, our neighborhoods. A lot of times we have to drive places uh, to visit destinations. Um, so that may make sense as compared to some of these more urban areas uh, where the other sites were. But despite these differences, um, residential buffers still weren't good um, measures for any individuals. For all of these groups, there was still less than 50% of their physical activity that was occurring um, for all of the groups. So next, we wanted to look at um, what percent of a residential buffer is actually used for physical activity. And this is important because in studies of physical activity and health, when we use a residential buffer, we base our attribute on the entire buffer. Um, so now we want to know, well, how much of that buffer are they actually using? And the answer is not much. Um, so if we looked at these half to one mile circular buffers, um, only one to three percent of the land area in those buffers was being used for physical activity. Again, I did look by sociodemographic characteristics, and there were statistically significant differences by race, ethnicity, education, BMI, and state. 
Um, in general, they were um, the, the overlap was smallest for non-Hispanic blacks and Hispanics. Um, it increased with increasing education, decreased with increasing BMI, and was highest for California and North Carolina. But despite these statistically significant differences, substantively, it was still small for everyone. And if you look at the percentages, maybe 6 7% is as high um, as it got. So I still think that this shows that residential buffers are not good means of um, assessing built environment attributes for physical activity. So then thinking about our flip question, it's what percent of the physical activity space is encompassed by a residential buffer? And this is important because um, it lets us know how much of the physical activity space characteristics we're missing if we use a residential buffer. And in this case, um, the overlap ranged from 21 to 55 percent. And again, I looked by sociodemographic characteristics, and I saw that age, education, and state were um, correlated with the percent of physical activity space that was in a residential buffer. Um, again, it was greatest for the oldest adults, those with a high school education or less, and for those from New Mexico and Pennsylvania. And I'll note that, you know, these are somewhat um, expected patterns. Um, you might think of the oldest adults as kind of having more activity close to their home. Those with less education might be not having access to travel as far. Um, so these patterns make sense. But again, the highest proportions were um, from 75 to 78 percent. So there's still a substantial portion of physical activity that's occurring somewhere else um, that we aren't capturing. So in summary, what I learned um, about this particular topic was that a lot of physical activity time is spent outside of residential buffers, and that the spatial overlap between my physical activity space designation and residential buffers is very poor, um, with adults simultaneously using a very small proportion of their buffers for physical activity and having a lot of their physical activity space away from those buffers. So to me, this suggests that we need to use other methods to assess built environment characteristics, um, things like GPS or ecological momentary sampling, where we can actually track individuals and see where they're going. So since this last aim suggested that we should be using GPS or something like it, um, that leads us to know that we need more recommendations uh, for using this tool in research because there, like I said, there currently aren't really any gold standard recommendations. So concepts of reliability have been uh, traditionally used to determine the number of needed wear days for accelerometers. So I use these concepts to calculate the interclass correlation coefficient using a hierarchical repeated measures analysis. Um, and then I use something called the Spearman-Brown prophecy formula um, to estimate the number of days needed to wear um, the monitor. And this uh, prophecy formula, which has a very funny name, um, came out of the education literature where they were trying to, teachers were trying to decide how long a test needed to be for them to reliably give a student the same grade. Um, so that's where all of the, the math was done in terms of developing this formula. And um, in our case, we're hoping to uh, this is just an arbitrary assignment, but I'm hoping to reach 80% reliability. And then we had to calculate confidence intervals using bootstrapping because there aren't um, methods for estimating the standard error for this. So this graph displays the number of monitoring days versus the reliability. And we can see that um, for a lot of the locations that we might be interested in, um, after four days of monitoring, which is that recommendation for accelerometers that gets applied to GPS, um, a lot of the sites have not yet reached 80% re reliability. So as a lot of authors in the field have suggested, it does appear that the, that four days is not enough for a GPS. It was enough for fitness facilities, schools, and footpaths but roads and parks required 9 to 11 days of monitoring, and homes, residential locations, and commercial areas required 19 or more days. Now, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I did do some sensitivity analyses, so our final recommendation was based on these results, but also some of the um, more intense physical activity. <laughs> 
So this, um, like I said, shows that that uh, often used recommendation for accelerometers is not enough. Um, but we decided that based on this sample, um, it looks like 12 days of monitoring would be enough for a variety of locations that would be important for built environment research and um, intervention research. Now, again, this is only done in one population. Um, we would need to have you know, this repeated in a lot of different populations before we could come up with a, a solid recommendation for the field. So I'll talk a little bit about um, what I see as strengths and limitations of this particular project. Um, so even though it is uh, much more geographically and sociodemographically um, variable than a lot of the studies that have been done, um, it still isn't a representative sample. As I mentioned, we recruited individuals from parks um, and only a smaller proportion from those nearby parks. Um, we focused on adults, so none of this research would apply to children. And um, we had a lot of geographic variability in our results. So this means that you know, what we found here might not apply to other locations. Um, another um, big issue that um, is present is that a lot of our participant characteristics were correlated with recruitment state. So um, for example, most of the Hispanics came from the New Mexico and the Los Angeles site. Um, most of the individuals with um, postgraduate education came from the North Carolina site. So there's all these um, mixings of demographics and um, ge geography that really makes it difficult to tease apart those two influences. Also, um, we aren't sure why, but the GPS compliance in Ohio and Pennsylvania was much worse than the other sites. Um, they were missing a large proportion of their physical activity data, uh, of GPS data, as compared to um, the other three sites, which had very little missing. Um, so it was done in the spring, summer, and fall, so not winter. Um, which I assume was done to control for that. At the same time, um, you know, we did have sites in the southwest and it was the summer, so I don't know if they completely controlled for that seasonality question, um, but they attempted to for at least winter. Um, and finally, as with a lot of um, built environment research, we really can't establish a causal link with these um, issues, and that's because, um, you know, we, we can't uh, distinguish out kind of choices that people make. Um, so if they, you know, just because someone's using a park doesn't mean that that park caused their activity. Um, so this is always something we have to keep in mind for physical activity built environment research. Um, but I do think it had several strengths. Um, it helped fill um, gaps for the spatial patterns of physical activity where um, we were able to look at the proportion of activity that occurred in these different locations. Um, it had joint accelerometer and GPS data for three weeks, which is fairly lengthy for this kind of a study. Um, so that gave us objective measures and um, also helped to improve generalizability over some of the other studies that use self-report. Um, and finally, uh, we used this process to develop some new, new tools and concepts. So we developed that physical activity coding protocol. Uh, we suggest the use of physical activity spaces. We also developed the GPS monitoring recommendation. And so again, we always want to bring this back to public health and uh, my work. So the overall goal of this project is to improve exposure assessment so that we can improve the validity and reliability of our studies so that we can then use our literature to inform intervention development. Um, so I think, you know, the goal of me coming here today and presenting this is to show you um, kind of the, the thought process that we have in epidemiology and how we're currently addressing these um, questions and show you areas where um, you all can probably help us do a better job of that. Um, so I encourage you if, you know, if you look at this research and you think of, of ways that you could improve exposure assessment, um, I encourage you to reach out to people that you know that are, are doing this kind of work um, and offer your skills. And um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, my different funding sources for the project and my personal funding, um, and also the SOPARC uh, GPS staff and uh, my co-authors. And I'm happy to take questions on any of these um, topics. I know I covered a lot of different things, so I wanted to leave plenty of time for you guys to ask questions.
<clears throat> so these were people recruited in parks, so they were they were using a park when they were recruited. And now you know, you, you coded things, you know when they were in a park. Is, can this data tell us, did they use the park closest to home or within the buffer more, or did they use a, did they choose to use another park that might be farther away? We could, I haven't looked at that, but we could. Because um, that's something I'm very curious about, mm -hmm. is how people make that choice. Mm -hmm. they choose, you know, how often do they choose the park because it's convenient or it's within that buffer? Sure. Versus do they skip that park and go to mm -hmm. the farther away? Yeah, that's very interesting. But it sounds like you have data that could do that. Yes. Um, yeah, we could look at that. Um, one thing that I'm trying to look at with the, um, where I gave the little sneak peek of what I'm doing with the park of, uh, facilities that are used, um, I'm trying to see, um, you know, if um, Hispanics are mostly using a basketball court, say, um, does that park also have a tennis court? Um, that kind of thing. And so far I'm seeing that most of the time, you know, if, if a particular group is using an amenity, that park still does have a, a different kind of facility. So. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like it's just what's available in their park. I think the point of kind of information, so like with Robbie's uh, question and with what you said about causality, there's often for us when we're evaluating individuals, so I live in Southeast Cary and I obviously work right here, and so I have the option to drive by Lake Johnson every day, and that's where I like to run but I can also come up Highway 1, mm -hmm. right? And so am I running in Lake Johnson because I drive by there every day and I was exposed yeah. to it and I'm therefore deciding to run? Or am I a runner who has purposely taken this route right. to find this three-mile trail? And that, you know, that's a yeah. lot to the causality. It might not be, I mean, yes, the environment yeah. is there, but my decision first is to be active and then I look for where, or is my decision I'm going to this place then I decide uh, to be active. And that, mm -hmm. that's one of the things we, we struggled with. Yeah, I asked yeah. a question from the same sort of personal experience because I'm surprised I haven't seen you at Lake Johnson. I'm here about three times a week myself. Um, I don't really remember. And I, 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 like you though, I choose to go there. I drive past at least three, four other places I could stop and do similar recreation. And I thought, well, why do I choose that? And I mean, there are reasons. I know why I choose it. But I'd make that choice to, instead of walking five minutes or riding my bike for 10, I drive my car for six <laughs> right. and go for a walk around the lake. Now, what, one of the things I see is relative to the geographic variability might have to do, and we keep seeing this within community planning, is the awareness levels. So, you know, it may be that in one place versus the other, they have a <coughs> better marketing department so people actually know where the parks are. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting yeah. to, to look at that, it may be interesting to see, you know, correlate that in. Do you have data on types of transportation that people use regularly for their daily lives? Or? For this population? Yeah. No, no. We just have, outside of the GPS and accelerometer data, which is very rich, the associate demographic characteristics that I told you, that's it. That's all we have. Um, so that is a little unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Question or more comments to what Aaron said, actually, and your notion that there is limitation in terms of Lake Johnson was not there. You even didn't have options right. to do anything, right? But still, right. I think there is value in this type of research because it provides opportunities for people. And yes, it's their choice, but still they do have opportunities, right? But mm -hmm. if there were no parks there, then there is no even choice. I think mm -hmm. it's nice to see that they always took took the type of mm -hmm. Sure, so um, I, there wasn't a clear guideline in the literature, so I looked up um, average commute times and um, used like the 90, 99th and 95th percentile of commute time, um, and then I used that to kind of represent usual locations that people would be willing to travel. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote this down, I'm not sure I got it correct. Uh, so you talked about network buffers were not a good representation of relative to a resident where they live, correct? Mm -hmm. Did you find anything different between network buffers versus the radio buffers that would, if, if people were using that type of buffering, one is better than the other, or? No, um, I really didn't see um, 
much that um, one would be better over the other. It's basically just slightly smaller percentages for the network versus the okay, circular. The effect of buffering are really not yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll keep clicking back. Well. So I, I was interested in the, the activity space and the way that you calculate that using the convex hole. And so when you when you showed the the picture of the wolf, that seemed to make sense because that kind of establishes a territory uh, in which the wolf moves. But mm -hmm. you know, like I tend to travel long distances in one direction and then right back in the direction, right? Mm -hmm. I, I maybe have an intact, and you know, I drive to the park and I have this intense activity, and I go home. So. You had showed an image where you were at another residence and where you're home doing activity. And can you explain a little bit more about how you change that activity space uh, calculation from the convex hole to kind of the, you know, you showed the two polygon mm -hmm. houses? And houses. Sure. So, um, yeah, let me. Uh... So, um, if this were just normal activity space, so I have um, my points around my house, I have my points at my friend's house, I would also have the points where I drove my car from my house to my friend's house. So now that's going to include all of this other area in here that I don't do anything in, I just drove past. Um, and so that's why I limited it to a specific bout at a time. So this is really, this is just what I'm exposed to when I'm you know, running in her neighborhood. This is what I'm exposed to when I'm in my neighborhood. But for physical activity, I'm not exposed to um, this kind of space in here where I'm driving. Okay. Can you use yes. the accelerometer information that, 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 that time frame while you're sitting in the car? Yeah, so the, the data are both minute by minute, they're matched by timestamp. And then I look at the accelerometer and identify minutes that are active, and then I look at the GPS to see where those minutes are. So, the, so uh, what I, I guess I was getting at with my question is, you're exposed to a number of things between those two locations. What about in the instance where you're driving by the park, and now you're being exposed to that, and then you start going there because of the exposure? Are you able mm -hmm. to capture that in your activity space? So these are all kind of like different questions of the same sort. Right. Um, so no, that's fine. I mean, this is this is what makes this challenging work to do is deciding what what actually are we going to try to associate with each other. Um, and so in my case, I was I'm coming from the idea of I want to look at where are people being active, what are those locations, and how do the how do those locations differ by different sociodemographics. And then I hope to be able to use that to. Um, develop interventions. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be sure that the intervention is going to work. Um, this is the only way I can really think to get at causality is to take what I've learned, translate it to an intervention, and see if it's successful. Um, so, for ex one example um, that I had was um, in my analyses, I saw that um, healthy weight and overweight individuals um, participated in roughly similar amounts of physical activity at parks. Um, but obese individuals had very little of their physical activity at parks. They were much more likely to have it at home. And so, to me, that suggests that there are a variety of things that may be going on to make parks not attractive for obese individuals. And so, what can we do to make them more attractive for those individuals? Um, and if we do that, will those individuals use the park? Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming at, is, is just trying to see, you know, what people are experiencing while they're active. That's the question. There are, I mean, there are studies, and, and obviously Kate could do it, where the, the entire day or entire three weeks is used to create the activity space. Sure. But in, in, in Oriel and I are working on a paper not with three weeks worth of data, but five to seven days, which maybe is, is, is a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you know, you then start thinking about exposure. So our exposure when we're driving versus an exposure of somebody who's commuting by walking. Like these are some of the questions. Like. How then, why is that actual exposure if you're driving at 60 miles an hour versus walking at 6 mm -hmm. miles an hour? What is, what is a true exposure? Mm -hmm. Also, one thing I wanted to point out, because some of us are individual level geospatial researchers and some of us are kind of environmental level, right? And so, so as more an individual level researcher two, two, and a health researcher, two things to notice here is the activity space she shows are hers because it's her data and she's given herself permission to show that to mm -hmm. you. So public health information or yep. information because it's got her home and how active she was or a wolf, right? So so that and this is another that, that's why I did that. We're trying to yep. disseminate our research. We have IRB 
restrictions on, on how we can visually display this information. Mm -hmm. Yep, I mean, those, that's exactly why those are my two examples. Um, I will say another, I did do another sensitivity analysis, so this is actually cutting off. So I also have a bout of physical activity, and these are, these are my normal locations of activity. I also have one on UNC's campus where I'm walking across campus, but that's, you know, way off of the map here. Um, so I also did one where I took all of, the, all of my physical activity points and made one space with that um, and did the same analyses. And so, I mean, obviously, everything goes up for percentage-wise compared to the smaller areas. Um, but I did look at both, so that's in the paper if you're interested in that. Do you have any quality of information for activities um, not, not for these individuals. They, they um, did do some surveys in the parks, but not the subsample of people. So, yeah, it's really kind of limited, uh, unfortunately, this data set outside of Yeah, so I, one of the things that I've thought about that, I mean, I'm nowhere there yet in terms of being able to do it, but um, in terms of in, thinking about future intervention development is kind of using mobile technology to recognize the built environment that people are in and then make suggestions, like you said, of where they might go based on what I know about them. And, and cell phones, mobile phones are great for the GPS, but because all 30 of us wear our cell phones in different areas, the accelerometry data is usually the limiting factor there. Yeah. Whether you've got a purse or a pocket or leave it in your office or you run while you listen to music or podcasts or you don't. So then it's the accelerometry that's the limiting factor with mobile phones. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Also a little bit off topic, but are you uh, looking at all, um, I mean, back to the awareness thing, you know, at, we're looking a lot at wayfinding in Pine Beach in terms of increasing participation using parks. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at that at all? I mean, I know it's, we're talking about uh, technology that we could put it on the cell phones, but is it any studies that you're aware of that are looking at the wayfinding and signage in terms of just built environment intervention? Um, not, that I, not that I'm aware of, but I haven't specifically looked into, into signage issues, but it's definitely something that would be good to think about. I, I hadn't thought of that, so thanks. So, so I was surprised to see that only 4% of the activity space overlapped with the residential buffer. Um, and so I'm curious if you have yet or considered taking into account what the actual um, land use it is in mm -hmm. this residential buffer. So like how much is private homes that is, is all, essentially off limits to, mm -hmm. to physical activity? How much is it is actually used? Sure. Mm -hmm. No, so I haven't done that. Um, kind of, and, and I have a slight reason why, um, and that's because I'm trying to compare my results with what most studies do of the built environment, and most studies don't make those exclusions. You definitely could and should, you know, especially, you know, if your buffer includes an airport, like, you should cut that out because nobody can go there, but most people don't do that. Um, and, and like I said, a lot of this is coming from, you know, people that are driving these studies are from the health environment, where, or health environment, health uh, discipline. So they don't have kind of the same background as maybe you all have. Um, so that's why I think it would be really good to, you know, work on collaborations between these kind of groups so that we really get better measurements of exposure. Well, that's a good point. You could look at what proportion of activity within the buffer correlates with the land use in the buffer. If 4% is parkland and 4% the activity occurs in the buffer, you can begin to say, oh, okay, well, there's some, there's a connection there. Mm -hmm. it'd be a, I think it'd be an interesting follow-up mm -hmm. with all your abundant free time. Yes. There's a lot of papers we can do in this data set. I have a lot of data, so if anybody is interested in projects. <laughs> I mean, it's not open, but, you know, I, you just have to like you know talk to the PI and make sure that it was okay. Um, I'm fine with sharing information, the data that I'm not going to be writing a paper on. It's just going to be sitting there.
seems like Oh yeah, and so so this is kind of a getting back to you know health studies just really don't do that. Um, it's just not a thing that's they just have locations. yeah they yeah. Mm -hmm. They still have forty five percent of those points at their house. Yeah. And I mean you know you think about like it seems innocuous, but at the same time you know you could do things with this data depending on the situation that's not good. You know for example. Um, when I was coding, uh, so I have their home address and I'm coding um, activity as occurring at home. Well, some individuals were spending, you know, five, six nights a week at a different location or a different residential location. So I consider that a second home, but that's potentially damaging information that, you know, you could have on someone. Um, a very kind of serious case that I had, I had an individual that you know, was at their home address for several nights, and then they were at a women's shelter for the rest of the time. Um, so, you know, this is a, this is kind of why we really, you know, shy away from making things publicly available for mapping things, is because there's a lot of really personal information if you think about tracking someone where they go every day, all day long. Other questions? Thanks, Getty. Thanks. Thanks for having me.